I was a pizza delivery driver for eight months here in Midtown Detroit. It felt like years. I've had some real terrible jobs since I dropped out of college, but being a delivery driver was by far the worst thing I've ever had to do for money. It goes way beyond just being talked to like a moron by some heavyset Armenian shop owner, or being screwed out of a tip by some white trash bimbo who lies about the lateness of her order. I've been robbed, beaten up, and almost killed while on the job. The first time was when I was delivering to an apartment building over near 8 Mile. I had just gotten out of my car and was grabbing the pies from the back seat when I saw this group of teenagers approaching my car. They start making jokes about how beat up my old Taurus was, and I'd be lying if I said they had no grounds to. That thing was a complete rust box. They're talking trash, I'm giving as good as I get, and it seems like it's just a bit of fun. That's when I feel one of their hands in my pockets, trying to grab the folded stack of dollar bills I use for change. I'm mad, but when I turn, one of the kids has this huge knife out, telling me to hand over the cash. I just kind of reacted. I hurled the only thing I had available to me right at the knife wielder. Now, I didn't expect this, but as I throw the pizza box, the thing just sort of falls apart in midair, freeing the pie up to land right on the kid's face. I always knew our shop had a reputation for delivering piping hot pizza. I guess that's why it's so busy. But the way that kid was screaming when practically molten hot cheese was getting stuck to his thieving face... Wow, it was ear-splitting. I saw that same kid a few days later. He had a bandage over the side of his face the pizza hit, and I'd be lying if that didn't make me smile. It wasn't even the robberies that were the worst, though, because a few years back, something started happening to pizza delivery drivers here in Midtown that's like something out of a horror film. A big part of gang initiations around here is taking a potential member out to jump someone, but since they were doing this in public, the cops got wise to it pretty quickly. After trios of scumbag Cripper Blood clones were getting locked up on the daily, the gangsters decided to smarten up a little. God knows whose idea it was, but, but some way, somehow, someone must have had the idea to ambush delivery drivers after luring them to abandoned spots throughout the city. The first I heard of this was a guy from another shop, getting a call to a quiet, mostly derelict neighborhood on the edge of town. He'd arrived at this big red brick house, walked up to the front steps, then had apparently seen a handwritten sign on the door that read something like, Doorbell broken, come around back, tip in it for you. Tip, that's the magic word that must have done the trick. Pizza box in hand, the guy walks in the backyard of this big old house where he sees some kid a pistol in his hand. No one knows just what went down, but it ended with the delivery driver being shot in the head and neck before their assailant stole nothing more than $20 and change in single bills. His funeral was about a month ago now. A few of the drivers at my shop stopped by to pay their respects. But I didn't. I kind of felt like I'd be imposing. Besides, I never mentioned it to anyone, but I always thought that the guy was an idiot. No one deserves to lose their life over a delivery job, but this was right in the middle of this whole gang initiation thing happening. Who drives out to an abandoned neighborhood after getting an order of any topping, any soda? After that, the shop I was delivering for started a blacklist of neighborhoods that were forbidden to delivery after dark. But even that didn't keep us entirely safe. A buddy of mine at the same shop managed to get himself jacked in the middle of the day, delivering to a fancy residential neighborhood. Some gang members had busted into a house whose owners were on vacation. He rings the doorbell, they pull him inside, then proceed to rob him of the maximum $20 and change. When he tells them truthfully that was all he had on him, they beat him half to death before stealing his car. He was in the hospital for a week while his jaw was wired shut. And that leads me to the last delivery I ever drove for Armin, the Armenian pizza place. The fancy townhouse beating my buddy suffered had me paranoid. Borrowing a 44 revolver from my buddy started me thinking that maybe I should just go ahead and quit. 
It was surreal in the extreme, being given a little rundown of how to load and fire the thing where best to shoot someone if you didn't want to outright end their life. It felt like I was enlisting in the army or something. I had to remind myself this was a freaking pizza delivery job. So I rock up to the address I'd been given, the two pizzas on the back seat, when I notice it's really quiet. There's a public park on the other side of the street, and thanks to a row of bushes, I can't see anything approaching from that angle. I get a bad feeling, like a really bad feeling, and take out the 44 from my glove box. That's when I see this dude emerge from the bushes on the other side of the street, and he's wearing one of those clown masks. This was right when all those attention-starved idiots were putting on clown masks and scaring people for the sake of getting that perfect viral video. But I didn't take the chance. I just started tapping on the glass with the revolver in hand, looking over at the guy with the gun, plainly in view. He stops, takes one look at the revolver, and then reaches behind his back into his waistband. I just remember cracking the window and shouting, Don't do it, man. Don't do it. You don't want to get shot. I'm not a particularly brave guy, but I don't know. The thought of ending up with a wired jaw. The thought of that poor kid who went out to work one night and never came home. I actually think I was ready to end this guy in the clown mask. He just wasn't a real person to me. He was a living embodiment of everything I hated about living in this freaking city. I kept the gun pointed at him as I drove away the two pizzas still sitting in the back seat. I quit the moment I arrived at the shop. Armin didn't even act surprised when I handed him back my uniform and collected the money I was owed for the shift. It's been a while since I quit that job, but I still think about it most days. It's in the news all the time. Some driver getting robbed or beat or worse. Everyone seems terrified of automation right now, but it can't come soon enough for some jobs. Jobs that just aren't worth losing your life over. I've had a few delivery jobs that had given me the creeps. One or two that I was pretty sure I was about to be robbed. Another was a gunfight between gang members unfolding in the street I was delivering to right as I was turning onto it. But these are just occupational hazards. Yeah, it sucks, but I guess you do get over them. Only one delivery job really, truly terrified me. The only one that scares me to think about even today. So we get an order from an address that none of us drivers had ever delivered to before. This normally causes some suspicion among us since we're always pretty wary whenever delivering to a new address. A fair few first-time deliveries have resulted in an address getting blacklisted, Sometimes they try to stiff you for money or some other scam to get free pizza. Generally speaking, the drivers take turns delivering to a new address and this time it just so happened to be my turn. So once the order is completed and the pizzas are boxed up, I take them out to my car and punch the address into my sat nav. It turns out the address is right on the edge of our delivery area, pretty much in the middle of absolute nowhere. It dawns on me that this could be the oldest trick in the book call the pizza into some hard-to-reach location, then demand it to be free once it takes more than 45 minutes to deliver. But, to my relief, I make it out onto this old dirt road with time to spare. Yet my relief doesn't last long, not when I see the state of the address I'm delivering to. The house is so run down it looks like a squat, like it's been commandeered by the homeless as a place to avoid sleeping rough. There's a musty old pickup in the driveway, its wheels all askew from years of misuse. I mean, the place was just the very definition of haunted house. Needless to say, I wasn't expecting a particularly generous tip. As I take the pizzas out from the passenger seat of my car, I start hearing this faint whining noise. My ears prick up immediately and I freeze, trying to work out just what the sound is and where it's coming from. I come to realize it's the sound of a violin being played, but more accurately, it was the sound of a violin being played very badly. These discording noises carried on as I walked up the dirt pathway toward the porch and the front door. 
The sound of some old violin bow being dragged across dry old strings that were way out of tune. Creepy, sure, but that's not what terrified me. When I knocked on the front door, the screaming cat violin sounds ceased instantly. A few moments of silence went by before I began to hear slow, heavy footsteps growing steadily closer. I can't be certain, but I'm almost sure I heard someone breathing on the other side. These heavy, labored breaths as I waited for the door to open. The silence was broken by a metallic snap of the door unlocking before hurried footfalls sounded on the other side. Someone had unlocked the door then scampered away from it as if they were overtly skittish about visitors. Um, hello? I got your pizza order here. I remember asking, feeling the tension rise as silence once again engulfed the scene. Uh, come inside, mister. A childish voice came from the other side. I wanted to just turn tail and run at this point, but returning to the pizza place without the money for the pizzas would definitely mean a verbal or written warning from my manager. I already had one for turning up late. I couldn't afford another. So reluctantly, I took hold of the door handle, turned it, and walked inside. The interior of the house was bathed in darkness, only a handful of weak oil lamps to give me any sense of the layout. A figure was crouched on a nearby sofa, the old violin laying next to it. There's fifteen on the table there, mister. The person sounded like a child, but they looked bigger than they should have. On the small, dusty coffee table in front of the couch, there's a pile of change in little piles. Normally, I'd have taken issue with this, but to be honest, I was desperate to get out of there at that point. I'd have taken any form of currency. As I stooped down to start sliding the little piles of coins into my cup palm, I started to hear the kids labored breathing again, but I dared not look towards them. I could see its legs in my peripheral vision, and even then, I could see how unnaturally long they were. This person was not a child. S sorry about the coins, mister. I saved them up. I saved them all up to afford this treat for myself. It's all I have. I had told the person not to worry in the sunniest disposition I could muster. The last thing I wanted to do at this point was upset them. I pocketed the coins, barely having counted them. I'd come up with a difference myself if I needed to. Like I said, I just wanted to get out of there. But as I turned to leave, hastily thanking the person, I caught a glimpse of the person's face in the low light of the oil lamps. They were burned, horribly burned up and down their arms and chest. The scarred flesh extended all the way up their face and head, only the person's features were obscured by a small rubber mask. The mask didn't even cover up their entire face, only a small central portion that concealed their eyes, nose, and mouth. The only thing I could really make out was that the mask had a long wooden nose, kind of like the puppet Pinocchio, whose nose would grow whenever he told lies. The small carved eyes were blank. I averted my gaze from the mask and was unable to return it. It was one of the most hideously sad and scary things I'd ever laid eyes on. Just as I had reached the front door, I heard that same childlike voice emanating behind me. Want to hear me play a song, mister? Before I even had the chance to answer to tell them I was too busy with deliveries to hang out, they had grabbed the old violin next to them and began to whine out of tune. Although the strings were almost totally out of tune, I started to make out the tune they were trying for. You know the one. If you go down in the woods today, you're sure of a big surprise. If you go down in the woods today, you better go in disguise. For every bear that ever there was will gather there for certain because today's the day the teddy bears have their picnic. I was in the back of the driver's seat of my car before you could say nope, I'm out, scrambling to start the engine so I could make a quick getaway. I don't think they had any intention of hurting me. I certainly wasn't as in much danger as when those idiot Crip and Blood wannabes decided to shoot it out like right in front of my car. 
but something about that place still creeps back into my mind while I lay there in darkness trying to sleep. Something that means I'll never, ever make another delivery there. I'll quit before I go back. About 10 years ago, I used to deliver pizzas for this small independent pizza place near Beacon Hill in Boston. If you live anywhere near Charles Street, you might know which one I'm talking about. Anyway, it was a pretty good job. The place was almost consistently busy and the boss was an awesome guy, so we ended up getting paid a living wage on top of the tips we made. One evening shift, stuff got weird. Really weird. So although my job title was just delivery driver, the other drivers and I justified our somewhat inflated wage packet by helping out around the shop during quiet periods. We helped out with cleaning, aided the kitchen staff in prepping their ingredients, and occasionally we helped answer the phone to take delivery orders. So this one shift, the phone starts going when I'm helping cleaning out one of the pizza ovens. No one rushes to answer, so I wipe my hands off and rush over to the counter to take the call. When I pick up, I can barely understand the guy on the other end. He sounds very old and has this raspy, gravelly voice that sounded like he'd been the subject of some kind of throat operation at some point in his life. I tried my best to make out what he was saying, I really did, going so far as turning the volume on the handset up high and sticking a finger to the ear free of the phone but I got nothing. Absolutely nothing. I ended up giving the guy a heartfelt apology before telling him I'd pass him along to the manager. When I handed the phone to my manager, I hung around just to make sure it wasn't just me who couldn't understand the elderly guy on the other end. My boss greets him before this confused expression comes over his face as the guy starts talking. Excuse me, sir? I think the line is bad. Could you repeat that? He maintained his politeness at first, but like me, soon lost his patience with the poor old guy. Sir, sir, I'm sorry, but but I can't really understand you. Uh, let me take you into the office where it's a little quieter. He placed his hand over the receiver so the guy couldn't hear, then made some comment about how this dude needed meals on wheels and not a pizza delivery. He heads off into his office with a grin while I carry on with the daily cleaning checklist. About 15 minutes go by when the boss emerges from his office. I think he's about to tell me how he hung up on the dude after battling to understand him, but he's still on the phone. Uh, yes, sir, of course. Sir, uh, right away, sir. Uh, we'll keep you updated, thank you. Thank you for your business. Goodbye. Different phone call, I figured. Absolutely no way could that be the same guy who had called with the raspy voice. Taking an order doesn't take 15 whole minutes. I asked my boss what the deal was with the old guy who called, if he'd managed to make sense of anything he was saying. He doesn't answer. He just puts his jacket on, tells me I need to watch the business while he heads downtown. I ask where he's going. He just replies, Chinatown, won't be long. There's only one reason my boss would have driven down to Chinatown so late. Ingredients. There are a couple of late night grocery stores in that area, some of which sell cheap quality produce. Only, I'd been helping prep all the toppings and whatnot myself along with the chef. I knew well enough we weren't lacking anything. When he returns, he has one of those airtight coolers in his hand, the same kind we use to pick up fresh anchovies and shrimp from the fish market. He then asks us to make a basic cheese pizza and to bring it to his office when we're done. We ask no questions. Bossman usually gets a pizza in his office during the latter part of the shift, and he usually asks for different things each night. So we thought absolutely nothing of his request. I box the pizza up, take it to his office, and knock on the door. When he opens, this disgusting smell hit me. I mean, it was honestly the most gag-inducing stench I'd ever, ever smelled. Before I even get a chance to ask, he grabbed the pizza box from my hands and shut the office door in my face. Whatever it was reeked that bad that it crept throughout the entire back of the house, to the point the chefs were hollering and asking who just crapped their pants. 
I mean, they weren't far off. The smell reminded me of when my apartment building's septic tank got backed up. It really did smell like raw sewage or something, just this rotten smell. I really wanted to know just what that smell was, but I also had no intentions of going anywhere near the boss's office again, lest I get another hit of that stench. But when he comes out of the office, that smell starts wafting around the back of the house again, and with this pained look on his face, he asks the two drivers on duty, myself included, which one of us wants a delivery. It's clear at this point that whatever stinks so bad, it's now on the pizza. The other driver just refuses. He delivers in his car and knew well that it'd take days, maybe a whole week to get that smell out of the furnishings. My boss is kind of panicking at this point. We have a sit-down restaurant too and we're in danger of the smell wafting into that area. He promises me a huge nightly bonus if I deliver the pizza, but I demand to know exactly what's on that thing before I ride it over to the guy's house on my scooter. He takes me all back into the alley behind the pizza place, then breaks it down for me. Apparently the guy had ordered durian on his pizza. Yeah, I needed that explained to me too. So turns out the durian fruit originates in Southeast Asia, hence why my boss had to visit Chinatown to get one. They're massive, with a spiky texture to the skin, but pieces of the inner flesh can be bought, pre-prepped from certain Asian grocery stores. I read that some people find the smell of the fruit to be sweet and fragrant, but I am not one of those, not by a long shot. But I did need the money, so I took the pizza around front to my scooter, threw it in the luggage compartment at the rear, then drove out to the address I'd been given. When I knocked on the house, the door was answered by a decrepit-looking elderly man with the small plastic tubes of an oxygen tank running from his nostrils. I had my suspicions for a moment, but then he spoke and I knew. It was the old guy that had been calling up about an hour before, the one I had barely been able to understand. He smiled wide when I handed him the box, and instead of the usual fold of bills I'm usually handed, he passes me this thick envelope, obviously full of cash. No. Change. Please. He wheezed, holding his finger to his throat. Dip is included. I opened my mouth to thank the guy, but my words caught in my throat. I was fighting off the stench of that durian pizza already, but seeing that guy begin to salivate and drool when the smell of that thing hit him, I couldn't remember a time I'd been as creeped out as that. Thanks, enjoy. I managed to blurt out. Any more and I think I'd have gagged right in front of the guy. It was weird, but I didn't want to insult him, not when he tipped so generously. It was a generous tip. Not long after I handed the envelope to my boss in his office, he emerged with three crisp $100 bills. They were mine. It felt pretty good having been tipped so handsomely, but one feeling overrode it. I ended up knocking on my boss's door for a serious talk. I told him in no uncertain terms that I wouldn't be delivering that kind of pizza again. The stench was clinging to the storage compartment on the rear of my scooter, and being summertime, almost every person I rode past slow enough complained about smelling something rotten. $300 was a sweet tip, but I'd be spending a third of that on cleaning products for every delivery of durian. Thankfully, my boss relented. He told me he too had found the whole thing pretty harrowing, but the guy had basically made him an offer he couldn't refuse. We hit our weekly target three days earlier because of this guy, my boss explained but he did promise me that we'd be making no more trips to Chinatown to buy durian just for one customer with too much money. So nothing more was said about it and we received no more calls from the guy. That was until about three months later. It was pretty much the same setup as the night he originally called. Slow business, helping out with cleaning tasks and food prep when the phone goes again. I answer only to hear the familiar raspy voice on the other end. I instantly knew who it was. This time, without listening to so much of a word he said, I just politely informed him that I'd be handing him over to the manager and thanked him for his patience. Knocking on the boss man's door, I hold my hand over the phone's receiver and whisper the words, Hey, 
Sturian guy, at my boss, who in turn rolls his eyes and nods as if to say I'll handle it. I walk back to my cleaning task with a grin, thanking all that is holy that I wouldn't have to drive halfway across Boston smelling like a porta potty. Only you can see where this goes, right? Boss man comes out of his office with a pained look on his face, giving it the old, uh, yes sir, no, no sir, right away sir, routine again. My stomach drops, I know what's coming. I remember shaking my head before he'd even asked, just listing off a thousand ways of saying no, cutting him off from even asking the question. No, no way, nope, no chance, nuh-uh, not today, I ain't the one. He doubled the amount. My boss replied, What am I supposed to do? I couldn't believe it. If what he said was true, I'd be getting a $600 tip from this guy. 600 bucks. That was just over my monthly rent costs with about 20 minutes of work. I'd be covering like three quarters of my living costs. Boss man had a point. Just what were we supposed to do? So, yet again, boss man drives down to the late night grocery store over in Boston's Chinatown to pick up this mystery durian fruit that I'd been reading so much about. While I waited, I grabbed a fistful of the air fresheners we normally handle in the bathroom and started to pretty much decorate the rear of my scooter with them. I also took a full can of Febreze with me from our cleaning supplies, planning on spraying it tactically whenever I came to a red light. Last time an open-topped convertible caught the smell of the durian on the breeze, the girl passenger almost puked right into her footwell. I actually start prepping the whole affair myself, too, getting the pizza base ready, opening up the back door and turning up the kitchen's extractor fans way high to maximize the chances of the stench wafting through the store again. But this time, when I get to the delivery address, curiosity got the better of me. I had to peek at this guy's pizza, if only to see what durian looked like. This was in the street like a block away from the address, nice open space, so I didn't expect the smell to be as intensely bad. Long story short, whatever was on that pizza was not durian. Like I said, I mentioned I googled the fruit when I got home to read up on just what exactly durian fruit is all about. What was on that pizza was some kind of meat. Not the yellowy, creamy looking flesh from inside the fruit. This stuff was brown, blackening around the edges, and it was clearly some kind of aged or decaying meat. I shut the box and tried not to think about what I saw, delivering it to the old guy, watching him start to drool again as he passed me the envelope, even thicker this time with bundles of dollar bills. As soon as I got back to the pizza place, I banged on my boss's door. He answers with an irritated look on his face since I pounded on his door so hard, but I didn't care. I had questions, a lot of them. Durian, huh? Yeah, we talked about this. It stinks, but we're making a buttload of money from this guy's order. I looked at the pizza. My boss didn't say anything. He just stares back at me for a moment or two, then invites me inside of his office to talk in private. I don't know what you think you saw, but there was nothing more than durian fruit on that pizza. I told him I knew that was a bunch of nonsense, that I'd googled durian fruit that same night I'd first delivered to that guy, that I knew well what it looked like and whatever was on that pizza certainly was not durian flesh. He sighed, breaking eye contact. What was on that pizza, man? He didn't answer. I asked him if it was legal. He didn't answer. Without a word, he took my $600 from the envelope and held it out to me. I took it, but only after giving him a week's notice that I'd be quitting. If he couldn't be honest with me, I couldn't continue to work there. We barely said another word to each other for the rest of my time working there. The final few days, he reeked of booze whenever we passed each other in the back. Whatever it was took a serious toll on boss man's mental health. Now about a year later, I'm working this decent little office job downtown, nothing to shout about, but it was way better pay for essentially just being a copy machine mule. That and the worst smell I had to encounter was printer toner and my coworker's coffee breath. 
But one balmy summer evening, I'm driving home to my apartment with my car's windows down. A scent catches my nostrils, something so hideous it makes me cough and gag as I'm sat at a red light. I look around seeing a guy riding a small scooter. The rear storage compartment has the logo of the pizza place I used to work at. The stench is horribly familiar to me. It's the stench I once thought was durian fruit, and the same stench I came to learn was definitely not durian. I took a gap year before I started university and I would highly recommend one to all those who have doubts over higher education or are second guessing their choice of course. Getting a job and suffering the daily grind was something that really helped me grow as an individual. In other words, working for minimum wage sucks and I had absolutely no intention of getting stuck in a dead end job like that. The whole experience made me hungry for the chance to earn a better place in society. But what do you expect as a pizza delivery driver? I know for a fact it's one of the most soul-destroying jobs that a person can be, filled with all kinds of employment pitfalls such as paying for your own gas, getting your wages docked for late delivery, and generally being treated like a criminal by your taskmaster turned manager. I honestly can't complain though. My dad helped me out with the finance on a cheap second-hand car. He even gave me a hand getting the rusty old thing back into working order. I may or may not have picked the delivery driver to put him in that position in the first place, but that's another story. So, the owner who'd given me the job in the first place was a top fellow. A Kurdish fellow who uh, escaped Sodom's Iraq in the early 90s. He'd come here with no more than a hundred quid to his name. But by the time I came to work for him... He was definitely worth more than a million. Alright, most of his money would have been tied up in various takeaway businesses, but the spanking new white BMW he drove around said it all. The guy stayed humble though. He always greeted you warmly, he remembered your name, asked after your family. Like I said, he was a top bloke. But the English bloke he'd hired as a manager for the pizza shop wasn't so nice. In fact, I go so far as to say he was a complete wanker. Good at his job, don't get me wrong, the place ran like clockwork, but the man had next to no social skills and really rubbed the staff up the wrong way sometimes. Like this one time, when he found out that one of the drivers had been losing pizzas, he did a little investigating and found out he was losing these pizzas to the exact same address over and over again. He'd come up with a different story every time. He dropped the box, some teenagers stole the pizza, whatever it was, but it turned out he'd just been dropping them off at a mate's house. Proper scummy behavior. Anyway, he gets the sack, but it was us, the drivers that remained, that really bore the brunt of it. He instituted a policy whereby anyone who failed to deliver or lost their orders would have the sale amount docked from their wages. Not the cost of the business, but the sale amount, so considerably more than the sum of any pizza's parts. We were mad, but I don't know, it was understandable. The pizza thief had really let the side down and it was hard not to sympathize with the owner who just wanted staff we could trust. So this is how I ended up almost breaking into someone's house one night trying to deliver their pizza. I drove out to the delivery address in my beat up old Vox Hall, listening to the newly fitted engine purring like a dream. It was one of my last deliveries of the night, with cutoff time being 11pm so I had that kind of second wind excitement that comes with knowing you're off of work soon. Still singing along with the car radio, I pull up outside this old Victorian three-story, grab the thermal bag from off of the passenger seat, then stroll up to the front door. This is about the time of night that tips get pretty big too. People can be very happy to receive hot food at this hour, especially when they've been partaking in a certain variety of tobacco, if you catch my drift. Anyway, I'm whistling away to myself, banging on the front door of this big old house. Banging, knocking, banging again. About a minute goes by and it dawns on me that no one is answering. It must be some sort of mistake, I think to myself, and head back to the car to check the delivery notes to make sure I've got the right address. This is where the problem arises. 
I really can't tell if the person who's written the address has put down a 1 or a 7. This is one of the few things that Europeans really get right. They always whack a little line through the 7s to make sure they're recognizable. Who'd ever written this hadn't given me the same courtesy. I decided it had to be a 1. The thing about the UK is we don't really get those crazy long house numbers like people in the States do. Like the Simpsons live on 742 Evergreen Terrace. I have that memorized, fight me. Whereas in the UK, I'm not even sure we even have 742 roads in total. I jest, but you get the point. So with me being 90% sure that this is the right house, but being 100% worried that I'm about to have 20 quid docked from my already meager wage packet, I set about trying to get this pizza delivered. I legged it back to the front door, hammered on it once more, just in case, then decide to take things a step further. I start shouting hello through the rectangular brass letterbox, but the only thing I hear in response is all this meowing from cats. Lots of cats. I also get this absolutely horrendous whiff of something truly disgusting, but lots of cats means lots of full litter boxes. Gross, but true. So the living room window is just feet away from the front door, and there's this little crack in the curtain I figured I can peek through to see if anyone is actually home. You'd be surprised the amount of people that call for pizza when they're not even home, thinking they'll be fast enough to get home before it arrives. Newsflash, you aren't, and you suck. But when I peer through the crack in the window, I see something that I still see when I close my eyes sometimes. The room was dimly lit, only the flickering gray light of TV static illuminating the interior, so it took me a few seconds to realize what I was actually looking at. All I could see was this one couch teeming with felines. I mean like every square inch was covered in cats, with a veritable legion of the little furballs surrounding the couch trying to leap up and join their feasting friends. That's right, feasting. On the couch lay the dead body of their former owner, an elderly woman who had died just a day or so before. Her cats had barely waited until she was cold before they scrambled over her body, plucking out her eyes and chewing her lips off. They tore away at the soft parts. Anywhere not covered up with clothing was a mess of clotting blood and torn flesh. Her own cats were eating her. I called the police when I get back to the shop, actually giving the idiot manager the finger when he tried to interrupt me giving a full account to the dispatcher on the other end of the phone. They thanked me informing them and I actually read about the whole thing on a local news site the next morning. My manager did actually try and dock my wages for the non-delivery when he told me I just quit then and there. Big twist. The Kurdish owner calls me up the day after I quit to ask if I was okay and more importantly to offer me my job back. He'd had it with the manager himself over him trying to unfairly dock me. He supported the policy to an extent, but not in a case such as this. I took the job back, but I did have a favor to ask. I'd be looking for a better job, but I needed a good reference. I was 18 and hadn't ever been employed before. Getting references was a nightmare. He said he'd give me a glowing one. Get this. I ended up getting an interview for a law firm to work as a legal apprentice. Low pay, but not no pay. This was pretty much exactly what I needed to secure myself a place on a law course at Newcastle University. During the interview, the quietly attractive 30-something clerk seems really impressed and did actually end up offering me the job. But it was what she said about my reference that made my heart swell. I can't remember it word for word, but it was something like this. We're very happy to have such a promising young personality here at Stanley and Doherty. Once we heard you were fluent in Kurdish, that pretty much sealed it. The way you saved your pizza place thousands of pounds a year with that new filing system, that colored us impressed. Um, yeah, I... The owner of the shop is Kurdish, so, you know, you... You pick it up here and there. The guy had talked me up to be some kind of prodigy. I got my uni place, by the way. I graduate next year, and I'm still pretty sure I have Mosin, the shop owner, to thank for it. 
and what I thought was a 1 did turn out to be a 7. Mind your handwriting, people. Seriously. You never know what we might stumble across. August 28, 2003. Brian Douglas Wells, a pizza delivery driver from Erie, Pennsylvania, begins his day like any other. Despite having worked as a delivery driver for coming up on 10 years, he hates the job, but as a high school dropout, he has few other options to pay rent. Just before 11 a.m., he drives over to Kearsarge Plaza, just a short walk from Lake Erie. This is where his place of work is located a small pizza place known as Mamma Mia Pizzeria. He delivers pies during the lunch rush, returning the Mamma Mia's in time to receive one more delivery order in the afternoon. The order is two pizzas, to be delivered to 8631 Peach Street, an address a few miles from the pizzeria. Brian has never delivered to this address before, but he knows Peach Street well. It's home to a handful of car dealerships and a family-owned landscaping service, Brian figures he'll be delivering to one of these. But what Brian doesn't know is that this is the last delivery he will ever make. When Brian arrives on Peach Street, he discovers the delivery address is down a dirt road, just near a BMW showroom. But at the end of the dusty, unpaved pathway is nothing but a radio tower. Brian gets out of his car, pizzas in hand, and looks around for the recipients. What happened next is unclear and has been the subject of years worth of debate between professional law enforcement and amateur sleuths alike, but the most likely explanation is what follows. As Brian waited for his potential customers to appear, a group of masked people emerged from the nearby woods. They were armed, keeping the terrified Brian at gunpoint while they produced a series of items from a rucksack, one of which was something that resembled a slave collar three rings of stainless steel with some kind of weird device attached. The masked individuals then attached the collar to Brian's neck, handed him a sophisticated homemade shotgun, as well as nine pages of handwritten notes. As the masked assailants fled the area, Brian began to read the instructions written on the pieces of paper he was given. They are addressed to Bomb Hostage. Brian realizes in utter horror that the device around his neck is a remotely detonated bomb collar. The notepaper in his hand details a series of strictly timed tasks involving collecting keys that will delay the detonation of the bomb collar locked around his neck. When he finds the final key, he will be able to defuse the bomb. The notes are also warning Brian Wells that he would be under constant surveillance and scrutiny that any attempt to contact emergency services or to remove the bomb collar would result in instant detonation, and therefore his own death. Scrawled on the bottom of the handwritten instructions was a terrifying warning. Act now, think later, or you will die. It must have been a living nightmare, a hellishly surreal ordeal. What happened to Brian Wells that day is something that most of us have never even experienced in our nightmares, but for Brian... It was a brutal, mind-bending reality. The first task Brian was given by his mass captors was to calmly and quietly enter the PNC bank branch on the very same street he found himself on. He was to hand the teller a pre-written note included in his bundle of notes. Upon inspection, he saw it was a demand for a quarter of a million dollars in cash. The note instructed him to use his homemade shotgun to threaten and intimidate anyone who refused to cooperate. Brian had no choice. He entered the bank branch around 2.30 that afternoon, following the instructions to the letter as he handed the teller the demand note. The teller's face must have turned white as a sheet. The note also stated that Brian's bomb collar would explode if the full cash amount was not handed over. Unable to access the bank's vault in such a short period of time, the teller gave Brian Wells a bag of cash amounting to just short of $9,000. Brian departed the bank as quickly as he'd entered, hurrying back to his car to continue his tasks. It is then that authorities received their first 911 call relating to the twisted events. A witness described a male leaving the bank with a bomb or something wrapped around his neck. Fifteen minutes after police received that first 911 call, 
A patrol car spotted him standing near his Suzuki Geo Metro hatchback. He was promptly arrested with police putting him in cuffs and forcing him to sit on the tarmac of the parking lot. Wells told police that three masked people had placed the bomb collar around his neck and instructed him to rob the bank. Failure to comply would result in his own explosive demise. Police must have been flabbergasted. It's not every day that such a bizarre, convoluted crime occurs before their very eyes. Whatever they felt, responding officers did nothing in the way of attempting to disarm the explosive device. Instead, once it was clear that Wells had no means of detonating the device himself, they waited for Erie Bomb Squad while they focused on evacuating the area of civilians. But time was running out, and Brian Wells knew it. If he was indeed being constantly monitored by his captors, they would know their plan was falling apart. At 3.18pm, just three minutes before the arrival of the bomb squad, Brian's captors detonated the bomb collar and blasted a huge, fist-sized hole in Brian's chest. There he lay, disoriented and bleeding to death, until finally his life slipped away from him. The horrifying event was actually captured on camera by local news crews, but thanks to a technical fault at a local TV station, Brian's death was never actually televised. However, thanks to a leak somewhere between the local station, WJET-TV, and the FBI, the video somehow found its way onto numerous video-sharing websites and, at present, is actually still available to watch. Perhaps most disturbingly, police investigators later traveled the route given to Wells on the notepaper and discovered they could not complete it given the allotted time. Essentially, however successful Brian would have completed his given tasks, his captors were always planning to detonate the bomb collar to silence the only man capable of identifying them. When the truth surrounding the incident finally came out, the world reeled in horror at the greed and malice of the perpetrators. The plot was hatched by a woman by the name of Marjorie Deal Armstrong, a college-educated woman with a master's degree from Gannon College, PA. Deal Armstrong required $250 in order to pay for the contract killing of her own father, whose estate had once been valued at almost $2 million. In an interview conducted before his death, Harold Deal reported that he had cut off financial support for his daughter decades earlier due to her criminal behavior and failure to hold a steady job. This was obviously enough of an insult to his daughter that she decided he had to die. But what's so tragic and evil is that Deal Armstrong chose to rag others down into the hole that she was in. It wasn't enough that her own life was a mess. She was so selfish that she would choose to murder an innocent pizza delivery driver who had no idea what he was driving towards that day on Peach Street, Pennsylvania. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located on both Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon. Take a Cheeto break. I would love some Cheetos.